Um, it's a distinct pleasure for me to be here at Yale Divinity School this afternoon. I would like to thank uh, Dean Sterling for this kind invitation to give this year's Ensign Lecture, which affords me the chance to pause from my globe trotting and to think systematically, if only briefly, uh, about the work in the State Department at the intersection of religion and diplomacy. I'm also pleased to give the remarks in the H. Richard Niebuhr room, in particular, despite the other Niebuhr uh, reference. Uh, from time to time, I like to chide my friends in the field of international relations that their recent discovery of religion as a force in a legitimate category of analysis uh, is nice. But scholars of religion have studied this subject for centuries, and uh, if not millennia, and they've been granting degrees related to the topic at least since the 13th century. So I, I welcome them to the party. I welcome them to this discussion. Now, I don't need to remind people in this room of the legacy of the Niebuhr brothers here at Yale and about their engagement with issues of religion and international politics. Having studied myself with the likes of Richard R. Niebuhr, Ronald Thiemann, Gordon Coffin, and Harvey Cox, the legacy of H. Richard Niebuhr is deeply embedded in my own scholarly DNA. And I'm thinking particularly of his interest in the historical and empirical in his work. His path-breaking synthesis of Karl Barth and Ernst Trelch remains so fruitful for interpreting our own age of chaos, crisis, and transition. So I think it's fitting that we spend time together today here in the shadow of H. Richard Niebuhr assessing the current attempt of the State Department to develop a more sophisticated approach to religion and global affairs. I'm going to proceed in four distinct movements today. The first movement will be a, a brief historical overview of how the State Department has approached religion in recent years and how the advent of the Office of Religion and Global Affairs stands against that background. The second movement sets out the structure and mission of our office. The third movement describes some examples of the concrete work we do around the globe. And finally, the final movement outlines some observations about the interplay of diplomacy and the scholarly study of religion. And then I hope we have time for, for question and answer uh, after I, I'm done. So how has the State Department approached uh, religion before the launch of our office? So I should begin by saying the Department of State has many offices that deal with religion far beyond our own. So it's not, is the State Department going to deal with religion or not? It has been dealing with religion. The, the real question is, is it going to get better and more sophisticated at it as a result of our modest efforts? Um, now, in recent years, the dominant approaches to religion in the State Department were two. First, through the lens of international religious freedom, and second, religion and conflict. And while there may be proponent in both camps outside of the Department of State who would argue that one or the other of those categories should be the comprehensive approach to religion, uh, neither taken alone exhausts the relevance of religion to diplomacy. Put simply, the political and social implications of religion are too complex and too large to be circumscribed by either of these approaches taken alone. Now, that's not to deny, however, the ongoing relevance and importance of international religious freedom and the study of religion and conflict. To fully understand the current iteration of our office, one has to go back to 2005, when a mutual friend introduced me to then-Senator John Kerry. That friend, Mike McCurry, which some of you may recognize, joined the 2004 Kerry presidential campaign in the closing weeks of the general election. In the course of the post-election analysis of that unsuccessful campaign, at least from Mr. Uh, Kerry's perspective, McCurry suggested to the senator that he meet me, given our mutual interest in religion and presidential politics and our mutual interest in religion and American foreign policy. Thus, at some point in 2005, I found myself engaged in a series of conversations with the senator. He has remarked in public that the odd couple nature of our relationship, that is, a New England Yankee Roman Catholic and a low church Southern boy, low church Protestant Southern boy, not to mention the greatest of incommensurate American intellectual gulfs, gulfs Yale grad versus Harvard grad. Uh, <laughs> but despite those gulfs, we found a way forward. Uh, testimony at least to his formidable diplomatic skills in bridging deep political philosophical divides, uh, which we now actually see bearing fruit in other arenas around the globe. Fast forward to 2013 and not long after he was sworn in as Secretary of State, he learned that he had the legal authority to launch an Office of Religion Advisor. 
and he invited me to leave the comforts of academia and launch the Office of Religion and Global Affairs, an invitation that I accepted after about 90 seconds of negotiation. His belief at the time was that the United States had not engaged religious actors and assessed religious dynamics around the world as effectively as it could have. Now again, to be sure, many offices address religion in the State Department. He hired me to try to increase that sophistication and capacity. His charge to me was to build an office that could advise him when religion cut across his portfolio, to also expand the capacity of the State Department to engage religious actors, and then lastly, to serve as the portal for various entities, including religious groups, non-governmental actors, civil society, or academic centers or think tanks, to help us explore how various offices and bureaus in the State Department might benefit from learning about their work and from their accomplishments. So that's the, the general background. The second movement is to look at the structure, the mission, and the vision of our office. Now two years in, we have built a staff of 30, possessing over 20 graduate degrees in religion or a cognate field. Now at one level, that sounds very impressive. But if you look at the background of 80,000 employees in the State Department, it begins to look very small. And when you look at a, a globe populated with 7 billion people, by some social scientific measures, 80-some percentage are, of, of those 7 billion profess some sort of affiliation to a religious group, uh, we have our work cut out for us. The first organizational task was to gather three different principles that had been distributed across the State Department bureaucracy, but who had some equities with respect to religion, so they were consolidated into my office. Uh, these include Sharik Zuffer, who is the Special Representative to Muslim Communities, Ira Foreman, the Special Envoy to Monitor Combat Anti-Semitism, and Arsalan Suleiman, the Acting Special Envoy to the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. It was a feeling that there were synergies to be harvested there if we all came together from our disparate spots to be in the Secretary's Bureau, which is a very centrally located office. The other center of gravity that we created in our office uh, was a team of six regional advisors to be our liaisons to the six regional bureaus of the State Department. The State Department uh, divides the world into these six somewhat justifiable, somewhat arbitrary uh, demarcations of the whole planet. And if we were going to be successful in socializing our mission to engage religious actors and assess religious dynamics, we had to collaborate with the regional bureaus because that's really where the heart and the soul of American diplomacy resides. Without successfully convincing them of the relevance of our mission to their diplomatic success, our office would simply be a shiny bauble of an office located on the secretary's team, but with no impact on American diplomacy around the world. Now, I should say at the outset, as a scholar of religion, I firmly reject any essentialist notion that there's a single essence of religion that can be named and then applied globally to every entity considered by someone to be religious. Nor did we construct a single definition of what constitutes religion. Indeed, we've built an eclectic team with regional knowledge of lived religion, and we've built networks of analysis which help us hone our understanding of religion in context without a preconception of religion abstractly conceived. If the State Department was to become more sophisticated about religion, given the complexity of religion around the globe, we are going to have to model an approach that recognizes the complexity and ambiguity of religion and not adopt a reductive approach that simplifies matters that should not be simplified. At the same time, uh, we couldn't simply throw up our hands and say that religion is such an unstable term that it possesses no analytical utility. So how do we describe the vision of our approach? Simply put, we envision a stronger US foreign policy through an effective approach to religious dynamics and actors. And there are four components to this more effective approach. It has to be strategic, it has to be comprehensive, it has to be inclusive and critical. Let me unpack each of these in order. When we aspire to be strategic in, our, in an effective approach to religious actors and dynamics, we mean one that engages key issues and groups to advance priority diplomatic and national security equities. We do not do our work in a vacuum. We try to align our work with the policy priorities set by the secretary and the senior leadership of the department. That means we have to be attentive to the priorities of US foreign policy. 
This does not always lend itself to quick and easy deliverables uh, that some in our current political climate demand frequently. Max Weber's old aphorism about politics in his famous essay, Politics as Vocation, I think also applies to diplomacy. He said, politics is a strong and slow boring of hard boards. It takes both passion and perspective. And certainly, the job of understanding the global role of lived religion is a slow, painstaking process. So by concentrating on strategically important issues in countries, our work often focuses on complex and longstanding problems. Increasingly, the strategic priorities of our regional advisors are aligning with the strategic priorities of the regional bureaus as we make the case to them that engaging religious actors and having a deeper understanding of the political and social implications of lived religion will lead to, to diplomatic progress. One need not go back very far in U.S. history to identify tragic failures of policy uh, and fed in large part by an appalling failure to understand the dynamics of religion and to effectively engage important religious actors. When we pursue a vision then that is comprehensive, we mean one that addresses all foreign policy priorities where religion is relevant. Now that's a daunting task, including those where religion is not always recognized as an immediate or direct uh, factor. This doesn't mean that we believe religion is, relevant, religion is relevant everywhere in every policy arena. Part of our work is right-sizing the role of religion in complex policy questions. There are analysts in the religious freedom space who believe that advancing religious freedom cures all political ills. Likewise, there are those in the religion and conflicts world who have a reductive view that sees this universe through the stereotype of bad Muslims and good Muslims, or even worse, moderate Muslims. We look for nuance and complexity where some pursue simplicity and stereotype. Our vision also seeks to be inclusive in that we reach, we reach beyond official leaders and institutions to include communities. If we only engage official leaders, we would fail in at least two ways. First, much of the formal religious leadership is male. So to meet only official leaders is to woefully miss the actual power of lived religion, especially if we miss the gendered nature of much global religious leadership. It requires extra labor and analysis to engage members of religious communities who are not senior leaders. In many contexts, senior leaders do not want U.S. government employees meeting with someone other than themselves. The second failure is that there's often a great diversity of opinion and experience within a religious community, and meeting only with senior leaders masks this diversity and can lead to radical misunderstandings on the parts of American diplomats. One strategy we employ in the pursuit of inclusivity is to encourage our embassies and posts to work consciously to expand their routine engagement with religious groups beyond formal leaders. U.S. embassies and posts build robust networks of civil society contacts is a routine part of their diplomacy. We encourage them to think inclusively when it comes to religious actors and we often help them expand their networks of engagement. There have been some critics who argue that any government engagement with religious communities has to be biased and discriminate between approved groups and non-approved groups. We've adopted a different strategy, one that is committed to inclusivity. We meet with any group that wants to meet with us. There is no official or unofficial list of endorsed or proscribed religious groups. Our only limitation is that we cannot meet with groups that are explicitly committed to violence. Our vision commits us to being critical in the best sense of that term. That is, we recognize the complexity, ambiguity, and diversity of lived religion through consultation with religious actors and academics and civil society experts. While we believe religion matters in diplomacy, we are acutely aware of the messiness of this realm of lived religion. While we do have expertise, we know that in our complex world, we do not know all there is to know or to be learned about religion in context. We are a learning organization and we routinely work to get smarter by leveraging expertise outside of our own office. I should add too that we are neither immune to criticism nor are we afraid of it. As one who routinely criticized the foreign policy of previous administration, I would be the rankest of hypocrites if I suddenly decried any criticism aimed at our office. 
We are deeply committed to deliberative democracy and thus routinely meet with harsh, moderate, and marginal critics of administration policies. I call it playing the pinata, but it's not in my text. Uh, my third movement then asks, what are some concrete examples of the work we do? Uh, I may truncate my list here. I've got four examples. I'm probably going to cut a couple of those out. But just to give you a, a sample of the, the many lines of effort we have around the globe. Um, in the spring of this year, while attending an, a Congress of African religious leaders in Benin, I met with a small gathering of diverse religious broadcasters in Cotonou, Benin. In our conversation, which started out simply as a sort of a meet and greet uh, formal meeting, it became apparent that all of these groups were united in the belief that corruption was a top challenge facing both their government and indeed their entire society. In recent years, the government of Benin has lost significant international development money because of corruption allegations. But in consultation with the embassy staff, we decided to work with this eclectic group of religious broadcasters to, sec to secure public diplomacy funding for these broadcasters to meet together and to air anti-corruption stories. And they found solidarity and protection by working together with a, a small uh, grant from the United States uh, Department's uh, public diplomacy program. Now, shortly after that visit to Western Africa, President Muhammadu Buhari was elected next door in Nigeria. Upon taking office, he cited anti-corruption as one of his three primary governing goals. Based upon our experience next door in Benin, we set out to find if we could uh, seize opportunities to engage religious actors in Nigeria to support the president's efforts to combat corruption. Early next year, we hope to collaborate with the US consulate in Lagos, Nigeria, to host a workshop of anti-corruption efforts with key religious leaders and anti-corruption experts from around the globe. This workshop will address the role religious leaders can play in combating corruption and seek innovative ways to engage religious communities to build a more transparent and just society in Nigeria. The workshop will aim to, number one, highlight the role of religious leaders and institutions in preventing corruption. Two, provide training on best practices to these religious communities. And three, to promote standards of accountability, transparency, and our integrity. It's our belief that these religious communities, and specifically the leaders, can be powerful voices in combating corruption in the wider Nigerian society. Convening these leaders and providing space for communication in which they can have a full and frank discussion about corruption would allow them the opportunity to discuss how corruption has had an impact on their lives and in their own congregations. Anti-corruption training would provide tools for enhanced transparency they would allow these communities to lead by example. It should also then now, on a second issue, come as no surprise that religious actors are at the forefront of the global effort to mitigate and adapt to global climate change and its consequences. The last class I taught at Wesley Theological Seminary before I joined the State Department in July of 2013 was to lead a cohort of seminary students on a two-week intercultural immersion trip to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. For years, Wesley has required students to do this kind of intercultural trip, and we've sent students all across the world. I was hiking in Yellowstone three summers, four summers ago, thinking how blissfully far from DC culture this space was, and a light bulb went off in my head. I could have been paid for years to bring students to this space as part of an intercultural immersion trip. So it took a little persuading of the, of the curriculum committee, but they endorsed the greater Yellow, the Yellowstone ecosystem as another culture compared to DC. Uh, so they bought my argument. And there I took the students where we studied the impact of global climate change with some of the world's leading cl uh, climate change scientists. We met with national park staff and a raft of civil society groups in Bozeman, Montana, where, by the way, I've learned there are more nonprofit organizations per capita than any other city in the United States. Uh, while also reading some of the more important moral and policy literature on climate change. So this is an issue that, that I feel in my bones as, as a theological ethicist. But the question was, how could I translate this professional academic interest into supporting global climate change policy once I got inside the State Department? Now, in collaboration with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, 
Every year, the State Department hires a small cadre of senior scientists to spend a year in the State Department working on public policy called the Jefferson Science Fellowship. To make a long story short, in uh, summer of 2014, I got a Jefferson Science Fellow into the Religion and, and uh, Foreign and Global Affairs Office of the State Department. And her name was Dr. Alice Bean, an internationally renowned experimental physicist who teaches at Kansas University. I asked her to do three things for me. I said, number one, map the offices in the executive branch of the U.S. government that deal with climate policy. Secondly, I said, map the global religious-related non-governmental organizations in the world that deal with climate issues. And number three, construct a strategy for building a bridge between the two in order to help the religious groups become more literate about the administration's policy proposals and then help those policy shops uh, understand how these religious civil society groups could magnify and shape our climate policy going forward. Now, after a year, our office has conducted a series of roundtables, briefings, and conference calls implementing the strategy that she designed for our office. This work will culminate next month in a religion and climate change symposium we are co-sponsoring with the Berkeley Center at Georgetown University. 2015 has been a very active year for the administration in the climate policy arena, and through our work, we have sought to enlist aid of religiously motivated actors here and abroad. As we move closer to the global climate negotiations, which will culminate in Paris in December, the so-called COP21 negotiations, um, where we also hope to launch the International Green Climate Fund, religious actors, along with the business community and the security community, are among the most critical players on the planet as we pursue a successful United Nations Framework Convention on climate change. Our work has helped to make sure religious actors are a vital part of that policy process. The third specific case I want to mention has to do with Cuba policy. On December 17, 2014, President Obama announced a new course in our relationship with Cuba, calling for a series of updated policies highlighted by establishing diplomatic ties with Cuba. We all know the pivotal role the Vatican played in helping to bridge or broker this policy breakthrough. Early then in 2015, shortly after the president's new policy, our office convened a gathering of over 60 religious leaders drawn from a broad sector of religious groups, faith-based civil society organizations, as well as faith-based development and humanitarian agencies to hear from a series of experts drawn from the Treasury Department, the White House, the Commerce Department, and the State Department. This briefing outlined the regulatory changes President Obama had announced on a wide range of topics relevant to those actors, including travel and remittance liberalization and the expansion of commercial sales and exports. We are currently hoping to engage in Cuba to build ties between a wide range of Cuban religious communities and the staff in our embassy in Havana. We want to make sure that our embassy staff there is able to develop strong relationships with civil society actors, including religious ones, in order to help us build stronger diplomatic ties to Cuba. Uh, I was going to talk some about our work in Ukraine. I'm going to skip over that. If you want to ask me questions about that in the Q&A, we can do that. But uh, I want to make sure we have plenty of time left. Um, the last example I want to mention relates to a series of religion and foreign policy working groups that we administer out of our office. As part of the Secretary's dialogue with civil society, the State Department convenes a number of regular consultation with a broad range of organizations in American public life. Uh, in the spring of this year, we conducted four working groups related to religion. One of these deals with international religious freedom, one on religion and sustainable development and humanitarian assistance, one on religion and social justice, which focuses on the rights of LGBTI persons, and uh, one on religion and conflict mitigation. Each of these groups was, was comprised of external actors who came into the State Department to give us specific advice on specific policies. We're going to be launching another round of those groups uh, to start the dialogue this winter on those issues, but also an expanded roster, including issues around gender, uh, training for diplomats to be able to do religious engagement more effectively, and addressing anti-sectarianism in Iraq. So that gives you some sense of the flavor of the many kinds of programs we do around the world. As I say, if you've got questions, I'm, I'm happy to field them. There are many other lines of effort, but I think those are indicative of some of the kinds of different work we do around the globe. 
Now, in my final movement, I want to answer how should the academic study of religion and its guild relate to this work. Now, let me again reiterate, there are many offices in the State Department that deal with religion. It's one of our goals that we can be the conduit through which academic experts can come into the State Department and begin to have an influence on this wider range of offices, not simply our own work. As I mentioned, we have over 20 graduate degrees in religion or a cognate field on our staff, including four of us with doctorates and with teaching experience. So we've got a wide and robust and growing network of global scholars who advise us, and we routinely solicit that advice. Given our interest in lived religion and our rejection of an essentialist approach, we're interested in the rapid growth of understanding of religion's contextual and embedded nature and how that can make us more effective and smarter in our diplomatic work. Likewise, we are the beneficiaries of a Henry Luce Foundation liberal grant to the American Academy of Religion to fund scholarly sabbatical fellowships for religion scholars to come into the State Department to advise us for a season. This January, we anticipate the first two such fellows joining us in our office for a year. Now, I have to admit, when the AAR partnered with the Luce Foundation, I had no idea if anybody would be interested in applying for these fellowships. My understanding is that 50 people applied for what's going to turn out in this iteration to be two fellowships. So I'm pretty pleased with that, that quick uh, and deep response. I believe it signals the high interest among scholars of religion in wanting to shape diplomacy for the better. Now, on the other hand, there's been a, a range of questions raised over the advisability of the U.S. government expanding its capacity in engaging religious actors around the globe. So I want to list a handful of those questions very briefly and then give you a, a quick response. And again, I should hasten to add that in the last 15 years, I have convened or sat on innumerable panels at the annual meetings of the American Academy of Religion on precisely this topic. So these are old and deep uh, arguments that I'm, I'm quite familiar with. The first argument is that the United States government must have an impoverished or reduced understanding of religion. Given our emphasis on lived religion and our strong diverse academic training, the alleged inevitability of this seems misplaced. Our treatment of religion is no different from other approaches, from approaches to other socially constructed categories such as gender, race, the political, or the economic. Those who advance this critique, I think, reveal both their exceptionalism with respect to religion and also betray, in Richard Bernstein's uh, felicitous phrase, a certain Cartesian anxiety because they deem religion to be inherently unstable and thus not a fit category for analysis. Absent some sort of epistemological foundations, a conception like religion has no utility to these critics, and we simply reject that. The second argument we sometimes encounter is that the U.S. government must project religious identity onto social actors that cannot be reduced simply to religion. Again, in fact, we seek to understand the complex interplay between the religious and multiple other dimensions of peoples and organizations. Against the insistence that government analysts are incapable of perceiving this complex interplay seems to me projects a fundamental misunderstanding of the capacity of well-trained diplomats. Thirdly, we're sometimes accused of instrumentalizing religious actors. After all, it's argued policy by its nature instrumentalizes the world. I would simply say that this infantilizes religious actors and betrays a lack of understanding of the work of many of them and their desire to bend the policies of what they perceive to be a more moral direction. This criticism, which is always a possibility, governments can in fact instrumentalize large groups of people, I don't think it accurately captures the nature of our interaction with religious actors. In my experience, given the literal thousands of people we have met with in the two years of our existence, they seem to be capable of holding their own in the face of the United States government. And in fact, they're quite adept at criticizing us and communicating their wants and needs very powerfully and very effectively. Fourth, some people argue that we impose liberal human rights norms on religious organizations as a precondition for engagement. On the contrary, it's perfectly possible for us to find areas of overlapping consensus and common objectives even when we start from very, very different worldviews. Lastly, some have argued that we inevitably oppose a good Muslim slash bad Muslim frame on the 1.6 billion Muslims around the world, or that we scan the globe trying to create these so-called moderate Muslims. 
Again, we actually work to reject such simple dichotomies while trying to bring a more sophisticated understanding to our peers across the executive branch. The overall tone of the inevitability piece of these arguments, I think, reflects an ironic essentialist view, not of religion, but of government policy and government actors. That is, our critics do to policy what they think we do to religion, and it is they impose a narrow reductionist framework. So to summarize, our relationship with the Guild, I think it's fair to say, is deep, it's robust, it's productive, and it's crucial. And we welcome the give and take, and we're stronger as a result of the critical interaction we have with the Guild. So to conclude, let me return to Hans Frey and to H. Richard Niebuhr, two names very much well-known in the hallowed halls here. In September 1998, Yale Divinity School and Harvard Divinity School in a refreshing display of theological diplomatic detente, <laughs> sponsored a, a, uh, a conference on the work of H. Richard Niebuhr, marking the 25th anniversary of his death. The lead article in the volume of essays that was published as an outcome of that conference was written by Hans Frey, and it was entitled H. Richard Niebuhr on History, Church, and Nation. Now, the day before that conference was to take place, Hans Frey suffered what proved to be a fatal stroke, and he died some time later. So this is perhaps the last essay that he wrote. Now, he had some essays published posthumously, but I do believe this was the last thing he may have or actually written. Let me read the opening lines to that essay. A distant but very distinct fragment of a layer of memories remains from the days of World War II at Yale Divinity School. H. Richard Niebuhr, introduced by Ralph Gabriel, a name some of you may know. He was the Sterling Professor of History here at Yale in that time. Um, but Niebuhr gave a lecture on the post-war aims. And Fry says there were many lectures of this sort in those bleak days when no decisive turn had yet come in the war's fortunes. Apparently, no manuscript or notes of his talk are extant. But the heart of what he said was powerful. Our innocence, he said, was gone. That innocence so much associated with our previous semi-detached place among the great powers with whom we associated. We were now a worldwide empire. We could either exercise our position with restraint or recklessly with a heavy hand that could not rest until it had encircled the globe. That and that alone was now our difficult choice. Now, I relay that story because I see parallels between that period and what we face in our own context. Niebuhr was worried about the new international order that was to emerge from the wreckage of World War II. No one could have foreseen the precise dimensions of the Cold War as he spoke in the early 1940s. No one foreseen the forces and global institutions that eventually came at the end of the war and in the Cold War era. But he was deeply concerned about how the United States would comport itself in that yet is unforeseen age. Likewise, I think we are in an era of great change in the international system, and no one can predict exactly what that international system is going to look like when it is emerging. Now, international relations scholars debate the emerging new powers of non powers of non-state actors, including the religiously motivated ones. My point is that now and as then, scholars of religion have powerful contributions to make in the difficult task of interpreting the emerging global order. It is my good fortune to help the U.S. State Department strengthen its capacity to engage religious actors and assess religious dynamics in order to craft a stronger and wiser American foreign policy. I like to believe that visionaries such as H. Richard Niebuhr would support our work. Thank you very much.
No. No? Okay. It's, broad, it's broader than that. It, it, but what, please. What is the, the, well, what is it? Well, because it would seem to me that since religion is always designed or is aimed at getting us away from self-interest mm -hmm. and concern for others, religion, a foreign policy is connected to military policy. Military policy always is just to protect ourselves. How do you deal with that? So, um, just as I came into the State Department, the White House promulgated uh, a national strategy for engage for uh, for impl for integrating religious uh, leader engagement into U.S. foreign policy, and it named three broad sectors of possible concern. One is in humanitarian aid and development, so that's not necessarily directly uh, in U.S. self-interest. So this is the fight against extreme poverty. Uh, and I can say more about kind of the latest iterations in that. The second uh, silo was uh, the promotion of a wide raft of, of human rights. So again, that's not just in raw self-interest, but that's trying, in fact, to empower people around the globe to be able to exercise their inherent uh, human rights. And the third piece is to uh, mitigate and prevent uh, conflict where, where religion happens to be a piece of it. And again, that's not necessarily directly inter part of American strictly defined self-interest. So there are many areas of diplomacy that don't fit into that kind of narrow uh, self-interest paradigm. Now, there, there are uh, theoricians of U.S. foreign policy who would argue that we should not be concerned about anything beyond narrow self-interest. That is not the policy of this administration. So if you think about those three silos, <laughs> religious actors cut across all three of those. I'm glad. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, we've got a raft of questions. We'll just start, yes ma'am, and then here, and then in the back, and then over here, so. Um, I'm Michelle Bungard. I got graduated from Yale Divinity School in uh, 2011. And I, interestingly, came here after a brief career in academia in international relations. And so you started, at the end of your talk, you actually started to hit upon the very question I was going to ask. Sure. Which is, you know, I can remember being at not American Academy of Religion meetings, but American Political Science Association meetings, International Studies Association meetings, as a person of faith, right. where I would engage with scholars who would say, well, you know, we need to negate religion, especially, you know, scholars from countries with whom we are very closely allied, especially in human development issues, who would say, well, this is just a non starter because it cannot be. I, you know, then went on to get my degree. I am now a priest. One of my parishioners now serves as one of the delegates to the UN Commission on the Status of Women, where she once again works with a wide swath of non-governmental organizations who are continually staggered by the fact that we, as a religious organization, are promoting the empowerment of women. How could that possibly be? And so I'm wondering how our allies and the non-governmental organizations which support human rights view your office in particular and your efforts. Uh, I mean, in a nutshell, they're, they're happy we're there. Because I think you, you've pointed uh, out something that, that I think is, is, is really quite true. Particularly in the human rights space, there are organizations that see accurately that are in certain contexts around the globe, uh, some religious organizations are in fact part of the problem. Let's just, let's just stipulate that. But the notion then of sort of excising the religious gene out of the seven billion people on the planet so far has not proven to be an effective human rights strategy. <laughs> okay, let, let, me, let me begin to stipulate that. Uh, there is certainly not a way that my 30 brilliant employees such as they are that we're gonna be able to snap a finger and suddenly some of these uh, religious communities are gonna do 180 degree change on some of the human rights stances. But it's my belief, it's our belief, that we have to engage these religious <laughs> actors in that hard conversation. Just to give you one sample in the LGBTI rights space. Um, I have had innumerable conversations with religious leaders across the world. Uh, and many times I'm simply told this is a non-starter, you know, we're never gonna change, this is a Western imperialist move, so please, please keep, keep going, don't stop. But the argument we're trying to make at this point is, is for the, the decriminalization or non-criminalization of LGBTI persons, okay. So we're not there to change people's theology. The State Department has no competency in saying your, your theology is A, B, C, D, or F, right? We, we don't give grades, we don't have that competency. But we can still say, 
that no human being should face threat to life and limb because they happen to be LGBTI. And there are many theological traditions, while they don't sanction that behavior, believe in the inherent dignity of such people such that they should be protected in terms of body and life. So there are ways of making arguments in some of these religious communities that do not require them to change their theology, but in fact to embrace other parts of the theology that recognize the inherent human dignity of every human being. So it's vexed, it's complicated, but at the end of the day, if the globe is going to make progress on some of these human rights issues, it will not be because somehow we erase the religion gene, but it's because we do the hard, daily, Weberian diplomatic work around the globe in engaging with these communities that are, in fact, uh, resistant. So uh, our experience with, with various human rights offices in the State Department has been uh, sort of their joy that we are there and we are their collaborators in this very difficult human rights work. Okay, and I think, you, did you have your hand up? I do have my hand up. Are you going to hear me? Yes, you so and then. I'd like to be a bit of a nuance on what she just said. Because sure. I um, am 76, and I am the um, um, co-director of the Working Group on Girls that sits in the United Nations. So, mm -hmm. of course, we are in very much in alignment. You would know that I know Carrie, 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 um, Peggy Carey quite well, yep. and we would work quite a bit with you. But, um, with, but within the framework of mm -hmm. Yeah. The sanction of it, but working with that. And I will say as an addendum mm -hmm. that one of our best partners mm -hmm. is Prince Ed of Jordan. Sure. Has worked with us for years and is now the High Commissioner of Human Rights. So I'm not saying that you don't have wonderful partners, even from parts of the world that sure. are not yet. Yeah, yeah. So so part of part of our job is uh, you know, I I, I had a I, I was meeting I actually I can't say who I met. I met with a senior yeah. global leader who presides over a vast Christian global network, okay. That person can make a set of theological arguments out of that tradition to their cousins, in-laws, and outlaws that the State Department can't make theologically. I mean, the State Department sounds silly, stupid, ill-informed if we start making, engaging in theological arguments at the grassroots level. We have no competency to do. Now, as a trained theologian, I sometimes feel tempted, okay, but, but that would be a mistake. So part of what we do is we try to highlight the theological voices who can, in fact, engage in the intra-theological discussions and say, you know, you have a role. You have equities and expertise that we do not possess, even though we share similar human rights goals. So I'm happy to play that role. I'm happy to tell people within these communities who embrace uh, a better human rights uh, set of arguments, use those in your own particular context because coming out of my mouth, it will have no cachet. In fact, it will, there'll be a, a reverberation, a blowback from that. So I'm happy, I do this routinely. The power of influence. Indeed, yeah. So I'm kind of the cheerleader sometimes oh, for some of the scripts. Lots of questions. I'm gonna ask three people, if you would, to pose your questions because we'll run out of time. There'll be other questions, but if we can answer all three, or Sean can. Good, we'll go. So in the back row, here, and then in the very back. Uh, so. Mike Kendall, uh, alum, uh, 65. This is a bit of a dated issue, but I'm dated. So. <laughs> um, in working with the State Department uh, the, under the Bush administration, uh, as a religious leader, um, it, we ran into an issue where the, the, um, the Bush administration was very much tied into right wing Christian advocacy groups like Freedom House. And in that, they were very nervous about the Ayatollah syndrome, so they were afraid of the Orthodox Church in Russia and very afraid of the CCC in China. Has that changed? Uh, well, I, I wasn't there. I, I can't do the comparison to then, okay? I, that's, that's beyond my purview. I, I will say, uh, it, we have engaged an astonishing array of religious actors, uh, numbering, numbering now in the thousands, okay, from the profound to the ridiculous, okay. Uh, 
no one has ever yanked me back and said, no, 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 you cannot meet with those guys. No one has ever said, you have to meet with these guys. Our door is open. We will answer. I will schedule an appointment with anybody whose schedule can, can reasonably match mine. And I think that radical inclusivity uh, marks our, our, our entire staff. So I guess I would say if what you described was the norm, that is no longer the norm in the State Department. Thank you. It's a recent grad. So t l let me tell you a story, uh, because it would take me hours to parse all of that. <laughs> Literally the first policy issue Secretary Kerry asked me to work on when I came into the State Department was ratification of the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The United States has not ratified that treaty. I would add that to the list of embarrassing omissions in terms of America's inability to actually uh, vote a formal treaty. Um, I engaged, again, Oh my goodness, how, how do I describe this? Uh, with not the usual suspects, okay? I, I went into some of those communities that you have named as being the opponents of these kinds of treaties. Uh, I was the fool who went to show up and knock on the door and say, why, given your other religious commitments, can't you support a global treaty that will protect disabled adults and children? Uh, now, I wish I could say I was so persuasive that suddenly uh, we were in a position to find 67 votes on the Hill. That, that did not transpire. We have to be the guys who are crazy enough to try and show up and engage those sorts of actors and ask them, why aren't you willing to do this? Now, again, I wish I could tell you I'd bent the arc of the moral universe in a more positive way, but part of diplomacy is frankly showing up and engaging people and having the hard conversations. I'm silly enough to think that's actually part of my job description. So I've had a lot of these conversations. I've engaged a lot of these faith communities and religious actors around the world, pushing every persuasive button I know, trying to get them to embrace it. Now again, I don't come and argue theology with them because again, this, this, the State Department, has, we're agnostic with respect to theology. We, we have no particular view, but what I can say is that these treaties expand the human rights of very vulnerable populations around the world. And in theory, most of these religious groups express a desire to protect vulnerable communities, and it's that disconnect. Uh, so uh, we, we tread where many people fear to go. I think that is indeed part of our mission. Now, we're not going to be writing op-eds. We're not trying to shame people in public. Diplomacy is very much meeting with people and having the hard, ongoing, long conversations. Now, if we should find ourselves again where somebody in the Senate is willing to run the, the so-called disabilities treaty back up the flagpole, I will be out on the street again trying to engage some of these. Very now, the good news is we actually did persuade some communities to formally embrace it. Uh, so it, it's hard, hard work, but that is indeed part of our work to try and have the tough uh, conversations with communities that historically don't interact with the U.S. State Department. So I wish I could guarantee we'd be more successful. At least you have to show up to make progress, and that is part of our mission, to try and show up. Last question. In terms Yes, sir. Um, we just, it, in the United Nations General Assembly week in New York City uh, back in late September, early October, our office sponsored a, a panel discussion on the so-called sectarian divide in the Muslim world. Uh, and we brought together, oh my goodness, there must have been eight or nine people at that table and, and had a, really a robust discussion. Uh, we are looking to engage that issue on the ground in certain geographical contexts in the Muslim world. I'll simply say, 
Uh, it's our sort of studied belief that sitting religious community A across the table from religious community B to air differences is probably not going to be very productive. Uh, Mrs. Casey's dinner table proved that between her five children over about 35 years. If we argued about what separated us and why we didn't like each other, that led to uh, negative outcomes. Instead, it's our belief that in certain contexts, Sunni and Shia share the same grievances on the ground with respect to lack of access to basic goods, no water treatment, no food, no public schools, no electricity, that if we can convene people across that divide to talk about common grievances in search of common solutions, that a side benefit of a productive conversation and progress on answering those issues is a reduction of sectarian tension. So it's almost a sort of Kierkegaardian indirect theology, if you will, his, what his religion be instead of religion A, uh, that if you try to confront this directly, it tends to ratchet up tension. But if you find ways to find areas of common grievance and then work together to address those, we think that there will be strong but ancillary benefits in the sectarian tension. So we're looking at trying to do this kind of programming in selective uh, geographical spots. That's a great question. Ago, the Divinity School persuaded a former Secretary of State, an <laughs> all right to come, and she was asked while she was here, what role did you assign to religion in the State Department? She said, it never entered my mind. <laughs> uh, <laughs> things have changed, and have changed for the better, and I'm very grateful as an American to Sean for the work that he's done and is doing uh, to make religion a, a responsible force within the U.S. State Department. There's a great deal of work to do, but we appreciate the work you're doing, Sean, and we appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you.